Okay, so we're looking at the emigre by Carol Rumans. Can anybody tell me what emigre means? Yep. Yep. Somebody who leaves their country. Okay. So it's French word for um, immigrant. But it's the French term for effectively what we would refer to as an asylum seeker. And also, somebody who leaves their country. Also, what do you mean emigra immigrant? Yeah. It's just the fact that it's, a fr it's the French version. And the other thing to concern yourself with as well, it's, it's the feminine version. Carol Rumens is writing either about her own experience or a similar person's experience, and it's feminine, which means that it's a female immigrant, a female asylum seeker. Now, there's not a lot to say about that aside from there are very, very few of these poems that are written from a female perspective. This one and poppies are pretty much the only two. When you think about the other women in the poetry anthology, the only other one is my last duchess, she's dead. Okay, the rest of them are either non-specific, somebody like Imti Asdarka writing about in tissue, for example, or they are passive rather than active, such as in My Last Duchess. Okay, whereas the emigre, she's talking about her own experiences and, and the same with poppies. So there is a link that you can make between those two poems. Okay, so if we move across to the actual poem... What can you tell me about the structure? Guys, please. What can you tell me about the structure of this poem? Anybody? Looking at the poem first, on, on, the, pa on the paper? Regular or irregular? Is it a regular or irregular stanza structure? It's quite clearly very regular. Okay. We've got the repetition of the word sunlight at the end of each stanza. Highlight that in a minute. And you've also got... What would you say about rhyme? Is there any rhyme? There's no rhyme to speak of. But it's her own thoughts, her own memories. What do we call that when we hear one person's story? Talking about poetry, yep. It's a dramatic yes, it's very much another dramatic monologue. So that would go very well with something like checking out my history, or we could look at something like remains. Okay, they're all dramatic monologues. There's a lot of dramatic monologues in this in this cluster, actually. Okay, so once we've got past that bit, now we need to be thinking about the actual poem itself. So let's have a look at the first stanza. There was once a country. I left it as a child, but my memory of it is sunlight clear, for it seems I never saw it in that November, which I'm told comes to the mildest city. The worst news I receive of it cannot break my original view, the bright, filled paperweight. It may be at war, it may be sick with tyrants, but I am branded by an impression of sunlight. So let's have a look at this first line. There was once a country. What does that sound like? Story. Yeah, it's storybook. It's once upon a time, isn't it? What does that imply about her memories, especially when you look at the second half of that line? I left it as a child. Sorry? Not quite. It is metaphorical in the sense because it is basically setting this up as like a storybook thing. Mm, 
It's more the idea of rose-tinted glasses. Because she's own her childhood memories of it, she sees it in the way she did as a child. Okay, that idiom, rose-tinted glasses, the idea of only seeing the positives. She was a child. She only has childish memories of it. So she remembers it as this kind of story. You could also argue that because it's a storybook opening, it's, it's memories she's heard about as opposed to experiencing. So um, it's that idea of being told about what happened before you were born almost. It's not always memory. These are memories that are you know, basically photographs. I left it as a child, but my memory of it is sunlight clear. What do we get from that metaphor there? Positive or negative? It's very positive. And you'll find as we go through this, there's a lot of information here that implies that she remembers it as being a city of sunlight, a city of beauty. You've got sunlight clear, you've got milder city, bright, impression of sunlight. Um, and there's more as we go through. So even in winter, we've got November and then the milder city and sunlight. What would we say that is there? November next to milder city and sunlight. Do we often think of November as being a mild time? Yep. Sorry. Yeah. So we have this juxtaposition here, don't we? It's November versus um, summer, basically. She only has memories of it in the summer. She doesn't recall all the, uh, the negative things of living there. The worst news I receive of it cannot break my original view, the bright, filled paperweight. Why a paperweight? Think about it. Why, why, what is a paperweight, first of all? Yeah. So it's quite solid, it's fixed, it's always in one place. So her memories are always going to be solid and fixed. But it's a little bit of an old um, idea, this. I don't know how many of you have ever been on holiday and bought home souvenirs. And, you often, and a lot of people would bring home a souvenir that's like a, um, what's the word, a snow globe. You know, with the name of the country written in it in the picture and paperweights and snow globes. So it's this idea that it's, again, when we're thinking about memories that we maybe don't necessarily have, but they are attached to um, items that have come from there. So this could be almost like a souvenir, this idea that she doesn't actually remember it properly. And I know I've spelt souvenir wrong there, but never mind. Um, she doesn't have these memories. What she has is the memories of other people. So maybe they are shared memories, told to her. Okay, the worst news I receive of it cannot break my original view. It may be at war, it may be sick with tyrants, but I am branded by an impression of sunlight. There's a bit here where, which I am told comes to the milder city, and that again links to this idea that she doesn't remember all of it. She only remembers the best bits. Somebody else is giving her this news. And we've got the use, of the, the use of the superlative here. The worst news. And then we have on top of that, it may, it may. Do you remember in Remains, we have probably armed, possibly not. That idea of got to be prepared for the worst. So this is what I'm certain of and this is what I'm not certain of. Well, we have this again, okay? The worst news implies certainty. But May, she doesn't know.
we've got this beautiful metaphor here, sick with tyrants. That whole idea that a country is made ill by poor government. Moving on to the second stanza. The white streets of that city, the graceful slopes glow even clearer as time rolls its tanks and the frontiers rise between us, closed like waves. That child's vocabulary I carried here like a hollow doll, opens and spills a grammar. Soon I shall have every coloured molecule of it. It may by now be a lie, banned by the state, but I can't get it off my tongue. It tastes of sunlight. So, what we have here, first of all, we, do we see more ev evidence of this idea of light in this city? You know, we had sunlight clear previously, now we've got white, we've got glow, we've got taste of sunlight. Again, it's this kind of rose-tinted, this really positive view of this place. As far as she is concerned, this is a city of sunlight, this is a city of beauty. But, I mean, even clearer would work with that as well. We have, as time rolls its tanks and the frontiers rise between us. So we've got two things going on here. First of all, tanks and frontiers. What sort of um, semantic field are we looking at here? Jack, tanks and frontiers, semantic field. What are we looking at? Tanks and frontiers, Where does it, what do they have in common? Yeah, so we've got two things we could take this as. First of all, this could, be, this could represent the war that has forced her to leave. Second reading, it's time that's bringing the tanks and time that is rising the, the frontiers. So what's is she at war with? She's at war with time. She's at war with the fact that her memories are fading because she's so far away. She wants to remember it, but she can't because it's, it's fading. That child's, uh, clothes like waves, that child's vocabulary I carry here like a hollow doll opens and spills a grammar. Soon I shall have every coloured molecule of it. It may by now be a lie, banned by the state, but I can't get it off my tongue. It tastes of sunlight. Okay, so again we're, we're reminded that she left as a child. Child's vocabulary I carried here like a hollow doll. Interesting simile there. What might that suggest? Ben, any ideas? A hollow doll? Yeah, the words that she used to speak, they're now quite empty, she, is, um, she no longer uses that language. Ah, pen's running out. So she's no longer using the language, but occasionally it opens and spills a grammar, but I can't get it off my tongue. So it's this idea, it's been banned by the state. So this gives a hint as to the sort of um, conflict she's come from. Um, you know, she's, effectively she's left as a refugee because of the way she speaks. She's a child. You would expect in most wars that when children flee, they flee because they happen to be caught up in the conflict. But what she's actually showing us here is that it's her very being that's no longer allowed there, simply because of who she is, not that she is um, attacked. More of this idea of sunlight, it tastes of sunlight. 
it's interesting that she's using what do we call it when we've got two words that don't make sense next to each other actually no, no there's it, let me add to that um words to do with senses that don't make sense we've got sunlight which is visual and taste which is quite surprisingly taste does anybody know what that's called when we appeal to two senses at the same time used it with you last year maybe once or twice it's called synesthesia i'm going to spell it wrong no matter what i do because i never get this right the first time but basically it's the idea of appealing to more than one sense it's like when you say um, the music tasted of bitter chocolate is the best way to describe it actually i think i may have spelled that correctly synesthesia and it's a fantastic thing. Uh, if you look at any work by Keats, John Keats, he has a tendency to use it an awful lot. And so it, it's that whole idea that the sunlight isn't just about her memories, what she sees, but her memories are all encompassing. She can taste it, she can hear it, she can touch it almost. Okay. And it may now be a lie. So you know, she have every coloured molecule of it, but it may now be a lie. This idea that her language is something that she that she wants to keep hold of, but it's disappearing. It may be a lie. Works with it may be a war at war. It may be sick with tyrants. She doesn't really know. All of her memories are from the past. She has no up to date information on her city on her country and then the last stanza i have no passport there's no way back at all but my city comes to me in its own white plain it lies down in front of me docile as paper i comb its hair and love its shining eyes my city takes me dancing through the city of walls excuse me they accuse me of absence they circle me they accuse me of being dark in their free city oh god sorry i can't see it my, hit, my city hides behind me. They mutter death and my shadow falls as evidence of sunlight. Okay, so we have quite a few characters here. I have no passport, there's no way back at all. So that's really quite hopeless, put negative. So we have this very negative idea here. It's hopeless. She can't go back. But my city comes to me in its own white plain. More of this idea of brightness. Interesting, when we have docile as paper, you could even link this to tissue in this idea of, pa of paper meaning things. Its own white plains. We've got bright, um, more of this idea of bright. It lies down in front of me, docile as paper. Beautiful simile there that idea that the city itself isn't what's causing the problem. What does docile mean? Anybody? Yeah? Sorry? Tame. Yeah, sorry, I misheard you. Yeah, no, it, means t it does mean tame. It means calm. It means chilled. It means relaxed. It's that whole idea of the fact that because her... It's, not, it's the sort of word we use to describe an animal. So if we're saying it's docile, what we're saying is, is that actually it can do her no harm. The city itself can't do her any harm as it is. Then we have, I comb its hair and love its shining eyes. What is she turning the city into? It's a doll. It's a very childish thing. You know, playing with a pet, a toy. It's, it's quite joyful, this idea. But interestingly enough, she's combing its hair. She's changing what it looks like. So what's she doing with her memories? Yeah, she's making the memories what she wants them to be. So we could possibly suggest that maybe she's forgetting about the negative side of things deliberately. 
My city takes me dancing through the city of walls. Now, this is an interesting one. Because walls suggest that she's not free. And we've had all of this beautiful imagery, boys, all this beautiful imagery about light and freedom. But at the end of the day, she's not free to return. She can't go back. So my city takes me dancing through the city of walls. So it's almost like that her city no longer exists and this city is what is left. It's not her city that she's dancing through, but the idea of my city takes me dancing. So we've got this personification here, almost like um, going on a date sort of idea, you know, maybe a boyfriend or something taking you dancing. And it's like she's dancing, um, she's imagining being there. And although it's the same city, it's different now because this city, the city of walls, she is not free within. Remember, when she was there, she saw it as all these beautiful things. She is now no longer free in this city. It sounds weird, that whole idea of the fact that a city can change, and although the physical um, appearance of it hasn't changed, because who's in charge of it has changed, she is no, it's a different place. They accuse me of absence. They circle me. They accuse me of being dark in their free city. So now we have an antagonist. They mutter death. How would you describe the they in this? Are they positive? Are they negative? Are they frightening? What are they? Sorry? Yeah, they're very negative. They're scary. I mean, they accuse me of something. They accuse me of being dark in their free city. Do you remember what I was talking about earlier with that whole idea of the fact that she's simply because of who she is, she's no longer welcome? Accusation. My city hides behind me. So she's taking up this protective stance. What is she protecting? Because her city, you know, she's not physically standing in front of the city. She's metaphorically protecting something. What is she protecting? Yeah. Simply by being alive and keeping those memories alive, she's protecting her city. They mutter death. So more of that frightening imagery. And my shadow falls as evidence of sunlight. It's a really positive ending. Even though they've just been talking about death. The shadow, the thing that you leave behind when there's no um, as evidence that whole idea of the fact that it doesn't matter what the city's like now, her memories keep it alive as a sunlight city. Her memories keep the old city alive. I mean, if you look at those last four lines there, they accuse me of absence, they circle me, they accuse me of being dark in their free city. And this idea of the fact that because she's no longer there, they are now allowed to be free. My city hides behind me. It's cowering, it's scared, it's small. And they mutter death and my shadow falls as evidence of sunlight. It's a really, really beautiful poem, this one. There's a lot going on here with this idea of the fact that it's still very positive. Okay, even when she is accused of being dark, negative side of it. There's a lot of 
her saying, I don't care that you think I'm dark. I know I'm light because my city is light. You'll see that there's a lot of enjambment in this, that whole idea of the memories being continual and keeping going and pushing forward. For it seems I never saw it in that November, which I'm told comes to the mildest city. And you get that idea of her being a child and remembering all these beautiful things and then being at, having a, added to, you know, imagine grandma saying, oh, I remember when you were 18 months old and this happened, it was the nicest summer. She remembers that. She doesn't actually remember that, but because she's her grandma telling her it so many times, it sticks with her. Is there anything anybody else wants to add? Okay. Fantastic.